examining narratives in the media and how that shapes and impacts criminal legal reform. We have four distinguished panelists that have joined us today. My name is Andre Ward, and I'm the Associate Vice President of the David Rothenberg Center for Public Policy at the Fortune Society. And today, as we spoke earlier, we want to look at how the media plays a role in criminal legal reform systems and what we can do as activists to change how the media portrays criminal legal system reform. Today, I'm joined by, um, again, these four panelists that we have here today. And before we get to them, however, just some small housekeeping rules, right? The audience can submit questions, right? Using the Q&A button that's in the Zoom. And we'll save some time during the end of this discussion for you to ask your very, very important questions. As noted, right, we'll discuss the need for further system transformation to identify and actually counteract potentially harmful narratives portrayed by the media. And so we'll introduce our guests as we go along. And what I'd like to do for our guests and panelists who've joined us today is to tell us briefly um, about yourself and your background and how this conversation about changing narratives in the media is relevant to you. I'll start off with MK. Thank you so much, Andre. I'm, I'm so honored to be here among these distinguished panelists who all do such incredible work that really transforms the way that people are seeing uh, our punishment system, but also the possibilities outside of those systems that we've really relied on for far too long to bring us safety when they've failed. Um, so I am a public a former public defender. I worked for, as a public defender with Brooklyn Defender Services for seven or eight-ish years, um, quite a long time, but I ultimately did leave to form my own civil rights practice. So I'm now a civil rights attorney. I also work with Zealous on a project called Justice Not Fear, which really combats misinformation in the media, specifically around New York's bail reform laws, but also all over the place because we are well accustomed to a media that really repeats police narratives that you know, enforces our, our current systems and the power dynamics at play there. Um, and this is relevant to me because I'm a New Yorker. <laughs> I'm a mom. Um, you know, I, I'm somebody who also cares very much about safety and wants to see things work. I also want my neighbors, my community members, my family members, my loved ones to be safe and free. Um, and so that's something that's important to me. And I'm just so glad to be here as part of this conversation. Absolutely. And we'll transition now to Daiwan. Daiwan, like, what brings you to this, this conversation, right? I think we all know, of course, because since we know you, but obviously what brings you to this conversation? Hey, Andre, um, and who are I, you? I think first and foremost, you know, I spent 12 years um, in prison um, and while incarcerated, um, was lucky enough to get an education through the Bard Prison Initiative. Um, and one of the students featured in the Ken Burns documentary, College Behind Bars. And after my release, we were able through a national social impact campaign to go around the country and show people that film and move the needle on um, Pell restoration. And we leveraged that film four hours, four parts to restore Pell grants to incarcerated people at the federal level, even under Donald Trump, which was a huge win. We did three or four screenings on Capitol Hill and then a bunch more back with different members of Congress um, in their respective um, districts. And then coming out of that campaign, co-led with my partners over at CCF, um, the Turn on the Tap campaign in New York, and leveraged again that narrative changing work to restore state level financial aid to incarcerated people in New York. And it was really, really interesting about that is when we did the polling around that earlier this year, we found that we had plurality support amongst 2020 Trump GOP voters. So this was a nightmare issue if you were a GOP candidate in New York or right wing media to come out against. And so when Kathy Hochul announced in her state of the state that she was going to restore this, we saw almost no opposition from the right. Right. And that comes out of narrative change work over social media over popular media, in documentary form, going into communities, talking to people about the issue, educating them on the issue. And so I know firsthand, just born out of my experience, like how important it is um, to be shaping our own narrative in the criminal justice space, because broadcast media is not on our side, um, right? And as MK said, they're too often digesting police reports. Yep, and we'll turn over to Scott. Scott, what brings you to this work? Who are you? 
Thanks, y'all, and good to see you. Um, I, like MK, we work together at Brooklyn Defender Services. I was a public defender for close to a decade, uh, first in special education litigation, supporting low-income families and kids uh, in claims against the Department of Ed to get them better services, and then uh, most of my time as a criminal defense attorney, and saw firsthand from right off the bat how despite a remarkable office and zealous defenders um, and a relatively progressive borough, still 95% of convictions were coming from guilty pleas, how true complicated stories of people who were oppressed by the system were being silenced and how all this was happening in empty courtrooms. And so I started thinking early on about why defenders weren't doing more to collaborate with community organizations in ways that lawyers don't typically do, which is kind of talk a lot, but actually sit back and listen. Why weren't we collaborating more with the people we represented to breathe life into the systemic injustices that no one was talking about outside of court? Why weren't we engaging more proactively with the press and on social media and creating our own media? And so we started to do that. And, and we did it increasingly over the course of um, eight years I was at Brooklyn Defender Services and saw extraordinary wins, some policy um, built with this broader coalition defenders more involved. We saw also just the power of a coalition uh, that was more aligned in New York. And so that led to Zealous, the organization I now run in the sense that defenders started reaching out and organizers from around the country saying like, what are you guys doing in New York? Are we allowed to do that? Are we allowed to talk about, um, are we allowed to talk to press? Because there's a sense that like, we just say no comment. And um, and now we work around the country um, in, in New York, but also in uh, locations like Chicago and Los Angeles and Houston, Louisiana, Mississippi, Prince George's County, Maryland, supporting local coalitions of defenders, organizers, people with direct experience currently incarcerated, formerly incarcerated or otherwise directly impacted uh, by the system to get better aligned and to tell more compelling stories to topple the imbalance of power and control over criminal policy and media that we that is now controlling the narrative. Um, uh, and uh, I, think, I think there's a better way. So with that, I'll pass it on. <laughs> yeah, we'll turn it over. Speaking of passing on, we'll pass it on to Walter. Just a little bit about yourself and your background and how this conversation and narrative change is really relevant and important to you. Well, it's, you know, first of all, I'm glad I got to go last. These are, these are some pretty amazing folks that are doing hard work. I, I have a company called Prisonology um, that is a expert network firm of former Bureau of Prisons uh, folks that are helping defendants, primarily a lot of federal defenders, federal federal defenders around the country. We do training, we you know, provide affidavits, expert testimony. I figured I used, I, I developed this model thinking like, well, if prosecutors can go on to be good defense attorneys, maybe former BOP people can go on to be good um, you know, mitigators um, by knowing the system. And, and, uh, and then I was asked to, uh, to write for Forbes um, on criminal justice and, and you know, I guess, a full confession is that when they first wanted me to write on uh, white collar crime, I started writing on like white collar crime about like, hey, everybody's guilty. I fell into the same thing because it was such an easy way to find that narrative out there. I could go to, uh, uh, you know, an indictment or press releases and I could write the same stuff that the New York Times was writing about the big case, you know, with just a little bit of my spin on it. And I remember I went to uh, some friends of mine at the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal who are also covering white collar crime. And I said, you know what, I'm going to start covering it like they're innocent, like they didn't do it and push back because you guys, I'm just writing the same thing that you guys are writing. Um, and they thought it was a great idea. And the more that I dug into writing about looking into stories of just not just white collar, but various sorts of crimes, it was disturbing uh, what I was finding about the media is that they have a ready source of information nonstop, day after day, of new stories coming their way. And we have fewer investigative reporters out there that want to look at another side of the story. And that's, in a nutshell, what we is is the the, the issue that we face. And that's why I, I you know, I've I just love to get involved in something like this. I'm usually talking about prison issues and criminal justice issues. Media is a big thing to me, and it's like a, something that I think needs a lot more attention. And speaking of that, we'll transition now to our questioning, and we're talking about another side of the story, right? Which leads me to ask the question to MK. MK, you've been covering 
obviously bail reform for some time now. And there was a narrative that was being spent in a way that was misleading, erroneous, and just outright, and frankly, a lie in many instances. And we acknowledge those from Trinity Church Wall Street, uh, Susan Shaw and others who put on another panel um, similar to talk about bail reform specifically, right, with other media folk who were there and in partnership with John Jay. So we acknowledge them for that. But MK, talk a little bit about that, right? What did bail reform in New York set out to do? And what is the status of the law now, right? And how has the use of language in certain narratives like impacted the fight, right, over the law? Yes, thanks. I mean, this is such a fraught issue, but really it follows a very formulaic pattern that we see over and over again. Whenever there is a move towards any sort of even minor decarceration, so anything that reduces the likelihood that there are going to be more primarily black and brown people in our jails and prisons, there is vociferous opposition from pr prison officials, from lobbies with tons of money, you know, we're including police departments, um, we're from prosecutors, and from the right, but I'm also meaning with the right within the Democrats, we need to be clear here because we do live in a blue state where people are very proud of those progressive credentials. And yet we see this play out just as much in New York and in fact, successfully in many ways. Um, so while there was this enormous misinformation campaign where there were lies about the law, lies about its actual impacts, lies about specific cases that were used to fear monger in very Willie Horton-esque type ways, um, there was also really enormous racial overtones. I don't even want to say undertones, overtones, right? We were seeing people really denigrated in the media, these tropes that were being used to describe them and to fear monger around primarily white voters' fears about black and brown people to really get them to oppose this bail reform law. Um, what's so incredible, I think, about part of this, you know, we've seen this play out again before this is not new, but is really how modest the bail reform law was. Um, we really just saw for certain misdemeanors and some nonviolent felonies, there was a presumption of release while a person was presumed innocent. Um, we were not talking about felonies that are classified as violent. I obviously need to be very careful about that because that doesn't always comport with our ideas of violence. Um, but we're not talking about large levels of decarceration. Um, certainly as an abolitionist, we're not looking at levels of de decarceration that are even approaching what needs to happen for actual freedom and, and equity. Um, but we were just taking a small step towards that with bail reform. So wealthy people who are accused of crimes have always been able to be free before their trials, with the exception of certain high-level crimes. Occasionally, maybe they would be remanded. Those crimes are not being impacted. Those charges were not being impacted by bail reform. We were talking about misdemeanors and nonviolent felonies for the most part. Um, and so that means that charges that wealthy people had always walked free on were free pending their day in court, still obviously subject to collateral issues up through an open case, but not pretrial incarceration. Impoverished people who could not afford cash bail now had that same right in some of those cases with significant exceptions. Um, that was way too much for right wing Democrats and for, for you know the GOP to abide. Um, and so unfortunately, there was a concerted disinformation push. We saw cases, outlier cases selected and fear mongered about. We saw lie after lie after lie about whether these cases were even impacted by bail reform, often they were not. Um, and we saw this, the use of racist tropes over and over again. And unfortunately, the result has been first through Governor Cuomo and then through Governor Hochul, two rounds of rollbacks to the law. Um, and so obviously there was a fight going on internally. The rollbacks potentially could have been worse where they're not advocates who are fighting tooth and nail to stop it from happening, but they did happen. Um, and so the, the ways that judges, prosecutors and police could jail poor people pre-trial have been even further expanded in a system that already reflects unbelievable socioeconomic and racial inequity. I mean, in New York City, we're talking about a pre-trial jail population that is 92-ish, sometimes more, depending on the day, percent non-white. Um, and now you have even more ways to add to those demographics, which is just absolutely horrible. Um, and so that fight is continuing, right? The, the law is still largely intact important parts of it have been saved, but it's very clear, I think, from this fight that 
they're never going to be satisfied, right? These pro-jail lobbies, um, even the public who've had their consent manufactured for the, these systems in many different ways, um, are not going to stop just because we've you know, capitulated and, and given away parts of these laws. And so we really need to stop doing that. Um, so it's a very long-winded answer. <laughs> it's something obviously we've been working on really intimately, um, but it's hard, right? We really need to undo many decades of, of people's understanding of the punishment system, of people's use of racist and classist and awful language, like to describe people, you know, we're talking about inmates, felons, but also, you know, defendants even is, is a really dehumanizing word. And then it gets worse than that. I mean, we see New York Post headlines using words like animal and horde. Um, and so we're really, it's really blatant. And I, I don't even like to use over uh, undertones because it really is an overtone. Um, but that's something we're fighting constantly. Um, you know, and I'll just, you know, I, I think a lot, I've been thinking about a lot about lately, Eddie Ellis and his writing on, you know, his open letter on the question of language, because we're thinking about, his plea, which I believe was, you know, early 2000s and obviously was informed by all of his work, by his wrongful incarceration, by his work as a Black Panther, by his targeting by COINTELPRO, to not use these dehumanizing words, but to rather use people-centric language. Um, and so it sounds simple, and I don't certainly want to suggest that words alone are going to solve this problem, right. but it's, it's important, it's critical, and that's some of the work that we're doing. Absolutely. And Scott, you know, when we think about this whole notion of what's happening here in New York State, uh, what are you seeing across the country in other progressive and perhaps non-progressive states and localities? Like, is the narrative different right, from the other side, or are there patterns of reporting? It's all really consistent. And I want to talk about the first piece that's consistent, which is the extraordinary success of these modest reforms. Um, like, let's just start in New York. I mean, MK spoke a lot about, you know, the modest changes, but let's look at what those actually look like. A hundred, over 18 months, 183,000 people free who otherwise would have been subject to bail. Over $650 million in taxpayer funds saved. No increase in failure to appear rates, no increase um, in uh, violent felonies, let alone uh, crimes involving guns. Over 99% uh, of people who are out, thanks to bail reform, do not go on to be rearrested for a violent felony. And yet, somehow people think it's a disaster. If you were to go in front, if I were to go in front of the state legislature in New York back in 2019, when bail reform first passed and named that success, People would have laughed me out of that hearing for being for kind of puffing, you know, for being too overwhelmingly generous about what that would have, what would, what would out, what the outcome would be. I'm, and what we're seeing around the country, I'm going to first start with the success, is the same thing. In Houston, there was a settlement back in uh, 2016, it's called the, called the O'Donnell Settlement, that wiped out um, the possibility of bail for misdemeanors, for most misdemeanors. In Los Angeles, at the beginning of the um, pandemic, there was an emergency bail schedule based upon health principles that kept folks out during the pandemic. Um, in San Francisco, the new DA, Chase Boudin, stopped asking for bail in as many cases. Um, in Chicago, the Pretrial Fairness Act that was passed this past year had um, uh, made the restrictions around electronic monitoring for folks that were out more um, just freer and fair. And the same result, hundreds of thousands of people freer or free than they, you know, than they would have been. Millions of dollars have saved, no impact on public safety, except in some cases the opposite, because we know when people are locked up, they come out far worse than when they went in, more likely to be rearrested. And folks that are out, they're able to remain in their jobs with their housing, stay with their families. So these are, I, 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 I'm just gonna say like the tactics that MK mentioned around, um, around press, around uh, the who's sourcing the stories, around sensational stories, defining the law when there's so much, not even more nuance, it's the exact opposite of a disaster. The fact that progressive um, leaders in all of these states um, are refusing to stand behind what I'd say are the most successful policies for public health, safety, fairness, and fiscal responsibility as it relates to criminal justice in history. Obviously, there's far farther to go. Those patterns remain the same, but it's important to note that around the country, these same kind of policies that are labeled disasters, that people perceive as dangerous, as unhealthy, as inconsistent with safety um, and fiscal responsibility are exactly the opposite. And I'm really excited in this conversation to talk about, so why do journalists 
keep doing this and keep, and why do people, despite the fact that data is pointing the opposite direction, we should know better by this point about whether cops are telling the truth or not, why we continue to buy this and then what advocates can do to kind of shift that. But the, the national landscape is extraordinary success paired with extraordinary misinformation to try to hide that success. Speaking of high too, right? You know, when you think about the impact of bail reform, there are a tremendous amount of success stories. Oftentimes those who have benefited from bail reform don't want to bring their story in the media because of the attention it would draw to their case. So there are a lot of success stories, but just people just don't want to come forward, nor to someone else's point, I think MK or others, or maybe Walt in his introduction, there are an investigative journalist going to find people who have benefited and are doing well, right? Following bail reform, right? Following the bail reform. So Walt, I want to transition to you. How do federal prosecutors use the media in their pursuit of guilty pleas or verdict? Well, it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's interesting because the, the word alleged allows uh, journalists to write anything that comes after that word. It gives them permission that they would otherwise probably be accused of slander without having any evidence, right? So if, if uh, a federal indictment comes down and it's alleged that, and then whatever follows after that is, as MK said, is a headline in the New York Post that it actually happened. Um, and I, I see that quite often. And, and the thing that, I, that I, I, I'm hearing here too is that the, these, these are permanent, these are permanent slanders against people that just live on forever because of the internet that used to not happen before. I've talked to people who've left prison and they said, hey, the felony, I sort of paid my time and I've done with probation and now I'm moving on with life, but a Google search is killing me. Um, Media actually recognizes this. Some, some news outlets, namely I live in, in Boston, the Boston Globe has gone back and said, we need to like after a certain period of time, expunge some of this stuff, get it off of our site and just say, we've removed the person's name or something like that. But that goes in front of a committee and that becomes very difficult. Like, okay, what, what do we do? It's hard to put that genie back in the bottle. And I think that the prosecutors to the, to the main question, use that because it stays out there. It's for every juror to see. It's for, you know, any other law enforcement officer to see, to go after certain people. And it's a bias and it, and it takes away from the, what is, should be really the fairness of the system. And, and I know in the, uh, particularly in the federal, it, for those of you in New York, I mean, you've seen the perp walks before. I mean, there, there is no a uh, rule about a perp walk, um, but we have them. You know, when are they used? Why are they used? Um, and yet it is used. And every federal prosecutor would say that they don't have a perp walk protocol. Um, so they use the media to the fullest extent, whether they can get a headline in the New York Post or the Wall Street Journal, or the New York Times, um, talking about the bad things that this person has done. And, uh, and, and it's, it's, I'm not going to say it's a weapon, it's a tool that, that prosecutors use and journalists fall into it because it's easy information to get. And so obviously people who have not been convicted of anything are obviously convicted in the public before they even go before a judge to be convicted or sentenced or whatever, right? And so you know, I, let me just say something on the end of that, because you know, I've seen a lot of these stories where someone's been in prison for like 20 years, primarily usually somebody of color. They've been in prison for 20 years and then they find out like, oh, you know, he's he's now getting out of prison. And like what a, like it's supposed to be a feel good story. That's not a feel good story. That's like who's accountable for that and, and who in the media covered that story when he went in? Because I, I can tell you, the media had a role in that. You know, the prosecutors are doing their job to put a person in prison. I, I kind of get that. I mean, I, but they need to follow the rules. But the media was there, too. And where is, the, where is their responsibility to cover this guy coming out of prison 20 years later and act like we're all supposed to high five each other, that justice has been done? I would like to go back and look at some of the coverage that those same media outlets gave that, that case when it first went in. I think that would be an interesting look of, to see the damage that the media does and the hand that they have into some of these things. 
And we've heard a little bit earlier, right? I think MK mentioned this idea of manufacturing consent. And Daiwan, I want to turn to you um, because, you know, what role does the media play in manufacturing consent around crime and policing? Um, they play a huge role, um, Andre, and I, I, I think, but prior to getting to that specific question, I just want to remind everyone, and I think this is fundamental to any conversation like this, is that most Americans' relationship to crime and criminality is completely theoretical, right? The vast majority of Americans are never going to be mugged. Their homes are never going to be broken into. Um, their car window is never going to be smashed, right? And the idea that any of those things could happen to you at any time, especially in places like New York City, which is one of the safest um, large cities in the country, right, is kind of ludicrous, right? But people feel that way because we have a media mix and environment that creates deep insecurities through fear mongering, right? And when people are scared, they make irrational decisions, right? And they make irrational decisions to put people who haven't been convicted of crimes in jail, right? And to pretrial detention for a year, two years, three years at a time sometime, right? And convince themselves that it's making society better or making them more safer when actually it's doing the total opposite, right? And the way that we get to that point in sort of that theoretical relationship to crime and um, criminality um, is through manufacturing consent, right? Which is a mass media sort of concept. Um, and, you know, we could also pull, you know, our political apparatuses into this where the media will, and specifically when we look at New York, you know, shooting goes up in Brooklyn maybe, or any neighborhood, right? Of concentrated poverty, by the way, right? Low income neighborhoods, say maybe for two months, right? And then the media takes that short run statistic or data to say crime is out of control in New York City when actually, right, if we look at it over a longer period of time, six months, a year, right, or even yeah. in a historical perspective, is that a radical low or actually down, right? Um, and they tell you this at the end of the article, but whoever gets to the end of the article, right? And so people come up with this perception that crime is up and the media and our politicians drill that point down for six months, for eight months, for nine months, and then they go conduct polling around it, right? And then they ask people, hey, do you think crime is up? And people say, yeah, I believe crime is up. And then they turn that into a data point and then use that data point to push bad policy, right? But it's an artificial data point, right? Because they're not, that poll is not actually measuring what people think or people's experience with crime and criminality, right? It is measuring the efficacy of strategic communications in mass media, right? And so we have a media environment, especially around crime and criminality and prisons and police in this country where consent has been manufactured and people's notion of what cops, courts, prison actually do is radically distorted. Mm -hmm. And speaking of which, right, turning to you, MK, why are police versions of events often taken on face value and repeated right, by the media without fact checking, right? To like go on to, like, to, to Dewan's point. And, and what impact does this have on public perception? Well, the impact is enormous. And the reason that it happens, to put it most simply, police are exploiting their positions as experts. So I think that people sometimes um, see police as neutral arbiters on what is true and false about crime and criminality. They are often themselves self-reporting crime data. So they're, you know, putting out data about this. It looks like hard, cold numbers. They're just the ones trying to, you know, do their jobs, keep everyone safe. You know, that's their position on this. In fact, they are deeply, deeply invested in holding on to power. Um, and so the reason that I think that their versions of events are just kind of copied and pasted. Um, you know, a lot of media acts essentially as unpaid police spocks um, for spokespeople. You know, they, they have a, an enormous social media budget. They have a spokesperson budget. They have people already speaking for their departments and they have this extra 
um, you know, propaganda arm really in the media. And I think the reason it, that they're able to justify it is this position of expertise and neutral arbitration of truth. Um, and that just couldn't be further from the actual truth of what's happening, which is that not only have police lied repeatedly, demonstrably on video, in print, on the stand, under oath, um, but also we have seen over and over again that their tactics have failed. Um, but despite all of this evidence that is staring people in the face, this idea of manufactured consent, which Diwan just explained, is really, really powerful. And that's because we have decades and decades of force-fed media consumption through policing shows, through daily news headlines. I mean, when you think about what is even considered a crime or what, what is considered to constitute a crime wave, we'll see things like people stealing food, right? Grocery stores locking down their, their produce because hungry people are coming to try to eat. Um, what about wage theft, right, by employers? What about all when we talk about violence and violent crimes? What about state state sanctioned violence, right? We're talking about living in a period where homicides by police have doubled in the roughly the last 10 years. Homicides of police have fallen precipitously by more than half, right? And yet which one is evidence of something that's gone completely out of control and needs to be really stomped down on? Um, and so it's all really incredibly important stuff to think about. Um, and you know, so often, we, you know, we just touched on this too, but people are only reading the headlines of articles before they go through. Studies show somewhere between 60 and 80% only read a headline before they share the article, not to mention before they just move on, so you don't even know how much people are internalizing. Um, but also people are just sort of going along with this idea that, okay, it's not working right now, but if we just spend a little more on policing, if we just, you know, trust this is what needs to be happening, everything will be made better. Um, and the impacts are horrible. They're really tremendous. The, the idea I think also is important that there's been this co-optation of who cares about safety. Um, I know for a fact that everyone on this panel wants to be safe. Everyone that I know wants to be safe. Um, as abolitionists, we all want to be safe. And yet we are painted as this idea, you know, as, as these people who are somehow opposed to safety because we oppose the institutions that so far have been tasked with keeping us safe and have largely failed to do their job, even while other metrics actually have improved safety over time, like spending per pupil on education and all these other things that actually improve social welfare. Um, and so that's all part of messaging. That's all part mm -hmm. of taking police at face value. Um, and it ruins people's lives. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, this is brought up by, by Wally, by Daiwan, by Scott, everybody who talks about the coverage when this happens um, right. versus the follow-ups when the police are proven to have lied, it's really striking. I mean, and that is a permanent part of a person's record. So it, it destroys individuals, but it also destroys our ability as a society to express ourselves in ways that are, you know, actually moving towards safety, right? To, to explore these alternative options that have demonstrated efficacy outside of policing and outside of incarceration. And we're going to turn to you, Scott, in a bit, but I'm going to circle to Walt, because Scott, what I'd like for you to do, obviously, is summarize, like, what do you think all this means, right? So I'm going to get to you, Scott. But Walt, I want to uh, turn to you, Walt, because you are now working with people who are defending themselves in the court of law. And how do they view the media's coverage of their case from what you've learned? But I tell you, the, the, um, they're a vulnerable group because they, they shouldn't really be talking so much to the media. You know, the media should, should be doing some of their own homework. But, we, you know, we, we take things like if you take the fifth, you must be guilty. If you say you want a lawyer, you must be guilty. Uh, I, I lectured a lot of universities and I tell these uh, finance and MBA students that if FBI agents show up at your, your door and they say they want to ask you a question, you should immediately say, I want to help but I want to do it with my lawyer. And they all think that, you know, why, why would I do that? Because I'm hiding something. Um, the defendants find themselves in a very difficult position. And, um, you know, they, they can't talk. They can't hold press conferences. They don't have, you know, a lot of times these are just regular people who in an unfortunate situation who can't, what are they supposed to say? They're not professionals at this. You know, how, how do they defend themselves in, in public opinion? And, and so, I, you know, because I really want to hear, I, I'm learning so much from these, these other perspectives. I want to hear what Scott has to say, but I, I just look at, at defendants being, there, there's not really a solution for defendants to come out in the press. The press is going to have to do some work and get in there and dig and start looking at some of these other issues um, that, you know, that, that are creating this misinformation 
you know, in, in the media, and the in the media should be really attuned to this, and they're they're not. They're they're really not. I mean, I I, uh, I, I just was listening to Dewan, and I'm thinking like he's exactly right about these creating these false data points on which we develop policy and perceptions, and it's just bad policy. Bad bad, bad policy. policy. Let's qualify yeah. that. Yeah. So. Um, but anyway, I just see him as a vulnerable group. Sure. That's the way. That's the way I view. I view a lot of the defendants. They're in a tough situation. Got it. And Daiwan, how are activists and advocates using Twitter, for example, to counter misinformation? And then we're going to transition right to you, Scott. You know, I I think Twitter has become a really, really amazing platform. It's the largest community of you know um, free journalists um, in the world. There's a reason Elon Musk doesn't like it, but I, I think in the same way that like Google democratizes access to information, right? Prior to Google, you had to have an expensive set of cyclopedias, right? Twitter democratizes access to criticism, right? In the sense of analysis and evaluation. So prior to Twitter, you know, the mass media owned the airwaves, right? They got their prosecutors and their police commissioners and their um, policing experts on TV. And that was the expert opinion. But what's happening over Twitter in real and compressed time, right, is the debunking of what CNN and the New York Times and everyone else gets wrong, right? And we've seen a shift in the mass media to more personality-based shows. You know, that's Cuomo on TV, that's Matto on TV, because they cannot keep up with the fact-checking of the Twitter space. And what's been really, really great to see, you know, people like Scott, Alex Karkastanis, and others lead the charge in counter disinformation on Twitter, right, and calling out the New York Times and other publications for repeatedly fear-mongering, calling out those journalists or people purporting to be journalists for reprinting police um, press releases. You know, when um, Uvalde just happened and sort of the defund the police um, movement um, rose has risen back up, a Times reporter reached out to me on Twitter and said, hey, we'd love to talk to you about defund the police. And I said, you know, I canceled my subscription to your publication because you're constantly fear mongering and I have no interest in speaking to you. Right. And that is me holding him accountable as a journalist for his failure to adhere to journalistic principles. Right. At his newspaper. And this has really, really been great to watch over Twitter and to see us be able to get headlines changed, to get articles um, factually corrected. But again, as MK said, you know, the damage has already been done, right? And they know this, right? They don't mind printing something that's wrong, right? Because how many people is going to see Scott's tweet, my tweet, so forth and whatnot? And that's why it is increasingly um important for us to continue to um, create space and build power and expand our platforms, especially over social media, where we can reach more and more people and counter the constant disinformation that is coming out. And I've seen Scott, saw you writing some stuff down, Scott, see the brain, the wheels spinning, Scott. <laughs> so like, what does it all mean, Scott? Like, what does all of this mean? You know, what can advocates do? And what are they doing that's working? Oh God, I was praying for like several more questions before you got to me because it definitely was not a time, not a time. I'm going to do my best uh, to try to try to piece the pieces together. I mean, I think one one thing to start out with is just again underscoring how dire um, the need to shift the way that media is writing about crime and punishment, um, how about how popular culture is portraying um, what is actually happening on the ground, how how critical this is because you know we're at this space where. There, there's mass media, like, or like we have access to iPhone footage that shows police lying and hurting people more than ever. People understand that police lie, and yet somehow journalists keep who know who know this keep printing the reports, and people keep keep buying it. And just underscoring this is just how easy. Going back to what Taiwan was saying, how easy it is to just pull the wool over people's eyes by 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 uh, cops and the press. Just last week, this is really important to note. Like the chief of the police. He was, Taiwan was talking about months at a time. The chief of police came out and claimed credit for a week where um, uh, shootings or uh, shootings and homicides were down. And a week later, when there was a sh several shootings over the weekend in Brooklyn, literally a week later, she was blaming bail reform for it. So it's this incredible ability to, you know, to claim credit when crime is down and then 
pass off credit when, when crime is up and people buy that and, and press prints it. Um, another you know, key example of why this is so dire and just shows that people are just buying this so much is just, we spend more than any other society in the history of the world on policing, prosecutions, jail, prisons, et cetera. And so you'd expect we'd be the, the healthiest and safest society in the world. And yet we're far from it. And so every time the, a police says, and then a, and a, and a press piece prints, the fact that um, crime is up, that's an indictment against our current system and actually an argument in favor of the other. So why does this keep happening? So, you know, first, it's, I think it's important to understand where journalists are coming from, not to excuse, but to explain. Um, and when we talk to journalists around the country, when I talk to journalists, they talk about, I wanted to do this, or I wanted to write another story, but I'm beholden to my editors. So a lot of what we need to be thinking about is not just changing the, the perceptions and the skill set of journalists, but equipping them to make better cases to editors and engaging uh, media rooms altogether. They talk about the fast pace of, uh, of, the, of the crime beat. And so um, one thing to think about is how to slow that crime beat down, how to actually bring in other areas um, like environmental justice um, uh, into a kind of the larger conversation about health and health and safety. Because of that fast pace, they need to rely on really reliable, and when I say reliable, I don't mean actually truth telling, but folks they can get right to um, as sources, and those happen to be police and prosecutors. So there, what can we do? We can call in uh, journalists and actually do a lot of the work that, that we're doing around the country, which is connect them and help them build relationships with sources that they should be talking to. These are defenders, these are organizers, these are people inside directly and outside of prison. These are folks who care most, in my mind, have the best ideas about what it's gonna to take to get to public health and safety. There's also, there are also a product of bad habits. And so we have to also understand that, yes, there are some really meet, like bad meeting journalists out there, but there is a call-in approach and potential um, with a lot of them. And we've been seeing a lot of success with just like giving journalists the tools from sourcing to literal language guidelines about what language to use and not to use, data trainings um, uh, to be able to, um, to tell more complicated stories. There's this education piece. I guess, um, last, but not, <laughs> last but not least, and there's actually more, but last for now, because I'm looking at the time and I've got to yeah, stop. And we got a couple of questions in the chat. <laughs> I got it. I just, well, last but not least, I think we, um, as advocates, need to do two things, we need to do more than two things. But one is recognize that fear is real um, in whether it's warranted or not, whether it's manufactured or people are literally feeling in fear for their safety because we cannot take for granted black and brown and oppressed communities as just folks that are naturally gonna you know, want what we're talking about, which is because we're all part of popular, we all receive popular culture. We need to acknowledge fear and the fact that violence does exist and point out and be proactive about what actual positive solutions exist that are data driven that can solve it. Thing two, and then I'm gonna stop, I promise, is going back to the stories we tell. Um, I don't think we can give up as advocates um, just because it is hard and just because it is fraught because we do not want storytelling to be extractive. And for defenders, we obviously have concerns about ethics and privilege, et cetera. But I don't think we give up in the stories that we tell. We, I think we need to obviously tell the sensational stories of horrible, of horrible massive injustices like deaths in jail and exonerations after a long time. But we've also got to tell more of the everyday stories of the normalcy of freedom. And they don't have to be you went on to get a job or you, or, or you uh, graduated from Yale Law School. I think if we tell enough or we, if we're able to tell enough stories about people just who are waking up in their own bed, putting on their own shoes, sitting at the breakfast table with their kids, going, walking down the street, smelling the fresh air, feeling grass on their feet, I think we have a chance to really breathe life into the very strong data and just make it more personal for more folks. Sorry, that was a little bit long winded, but you did set me up, Andre, I'm just saying. <laughs> Sorry about that. Perfectly fine, Scott, but I knew you'd give us a really good answer. And so have a question in the chat. Uh, I'll mention Amy's just first name. Her name is Amy. And as a reformed Jewish congregation member and lay leader, could the panelists advise how faith communities can help get out the positive messages about criminal law, including bail reform and meet the media? write letters, host panels, et cetera. And anyone can take that, that 
question. We have about maybe eight minutes or so, but anyone can take that question and answer it. I happen to know Amy and um, a lot of my friends over at Central Synagogue. Um, so I'll um, jump in and say that, like, you know, I, I think places like Central and other faith leaders should really, really be making space um, within their congregations, um, within their chapels, their synagogues, their mosques to educate their congregation around these issues, right? You hold an important position in communities. And you can't even assume, even if your parishers are smart, your congregants are smart, that they understand the complexities of these issues, right? And so putting panels in place like this, or maybe even, you know, going through, you know, um, study guide kind of curriculums, right? Like my friend Bianca Tylek at Worth Rises is an amazing prison curriculum that takes you through the entire prison industry, right? Making that a key component sort of of your programming um, at your um, organization, right? I think is a really, really great way to start changing people's perspective around these things. Because ultimately, we have to re-educate people, right? The media is going to keep doing what is does. It is fast paced and it relies on people not having proximity to these issues, right? It relies on people having only theoretical relationship. So the better understanding people have of these issues, they can look at things in the media and say, oh, wow, like, actually, that's not true. Or I've read somewhere that that's wrong, and they have resources where they can go fact check themselves. Anybody else? MK, yeah, anybody well, else want to take a, a I, did, I just wanted to I just did something real quick, and it's building on what Scott said and, and what DeWan was just talking about is that we do have to tell the stories, and, and faith groups are in our prisons. And, you know, there's a lot of faith groups that, that reach out and do work in prison. And maybe it's not something that they publicize as, you know, I'm not going to be critical of them for, for getting in there, but maybe that's a, that's certainly an angle to, to tell people what they're doing, you know, and, and that, I think it's an important thing and, and faith groups are really big in our justice system. They're in our prisons, they're helping inmates, they're helping, you know, defend, you know, they're, they're helping people try to transition. And I, I, I totally agree with Scott, we've got to tell stories of freedom and as it relates to incarceration, we, we have to tell those stories of people. And it's just it's just being normal. They're just normal people. They're people. And I think that 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 message needs to get out there more. Got it. Hilton Webb, I think, had his hand raised. Hilton, are you there? He may no longer be there. I'll move to the next question. Hilton, you had your hand raised. And we have about maybe seven minutes or so left. So if we can get it across quickly and as much as you can, and we can respond as quickly as we can. Hilton? He's asking to be off mute. Okay, we'll circle back to Hilton. Hilton, you're on. We don't hear you, Hilton. Okay, Kenneth Pants gonna speak. So we have one more question. Um, how can someone who is not on social media get started? Who should we be following? MK, you want to take some of that? And then we'll circle the others for a couple of comments too, and then we'll have some closing remarks. Um, so if the question is whether you want to get started on social media, I think that Daiwan is a very good person to follow. Scott's a good person to follow. There are many organizations and activists that are working tirelessly to kind of create their own channels of correction to what's happening in the media. Um, and so I think that's a very good place to start. Um, if you're looking to continue to stay off of social media, which is also something that is fine and that you can have a huge impact in real life, um, I think that that's great too. And the, the best place to start is to get involved in your own community. Um, there are really wonderful organizations here in New York City, uh, very specific community-based um, organizations. So obviously there are, there are broad co uh, communities like Fortune Society, like that are citywide, but they're also within your own organization, on your own block. There are places to really start in your own faith community. There are places to start organizing people against these harmful narratives, but also for pro-social things. Um, I think what we think about a lot as, from, speaking for myself as an abolitionist, is the idea that abolition is not a an absence, it's a presence, which is something that Ruth Wilson Gilmore says, and that's something that's really important to carry through. Because the idea that we're all talking about is not we're going to tear down all of these institutions and leave nothing in their place. The idea is that we're tearing them down and replacing them with what communities really need, what we all really need, which is, you know, 
fresh food, healthy food, parks, safe streets, um, education, all of these other wonderful things. And so organizing within your community, starting incredibly micro and small and building out is something that you can do as well. Um, so it's not only important to be educated, but it's important to really do the work. Um, and I know the people on this panel are doing that. That's a really good example. So while we're talking about language and messaging and speaking, we're also behind the scenes actually getting stuff done. Um, and so there's many places to start and you don't necessarily have to be terminally online <laughs> to make it happen. And just want to acknowledge the, the attendees who are joining us, right? You're unable to um, speak, right? But you can put your question in the question box, right? So that's why you're unable to say anything because you're unable to speak because it's set up in that way. Somebody had something they want to say and then yeah, we'll briefly, take like a, Andre, a minute just... a minute from each of you as a roundup. We have about five minutes left. Yes, I want. Just to um, piggyback off what MK said, and I think this is especially important for people in New York City, um, as someone who's worked very closely with New York City Council, like you have a council person, it is extremely, they actually have real power in New York City. It is extremely important for them to be hearing from you, your communities, your congregations on a consistent basis that like the status quo is not how we get to public safety, right? Continual investments in policing is not how we get to um, public safety, like the public you know, outside of being on social media, outside of that, like there are real things you can do in your community with regard to our electoral politics that can bring about real change. And so be constantly communicating to them to people as a constituent that you expect something different from then than what has been done because what is being done is constantly failing, right? 11 people have died this year on Rikers Island, right? That should be unconscionable when we're spending half a million dollars a year to keep each person there, right? So I'll take that from Dewan as what you want people to walk away with today. And I'll transition to Scott. In a minute, Scott, if you're able, what do you want people to walk away with today? Okay. Walk away from this. You got it. Two, two main things. One, yeah, I hate saying it, but do not believe police. What they say, whether you're being stopped by a police officer, whether they're coming to your house, whether they're responding, whether they're saying something in, the, in, in press, you can assume that it is not true. They've proven it time and time again. I'm sorry to have to say that. And that applies also to, our, to the New York City mayor and other progressive leaders that are just kind of voicing that, that opinion, <laughs> their opinions. They are motivated by wanting to preserve the status quo and they can't be trusted. And I'm sorry to say that. Number two, demand truth from those who you might be able to get to do better. And that includes journalists. So be more skeptical consumers of news and media and demand better from them. And also demand better from your lawmakers, right? Lawmakers, let's talk to say democratic and, and progressive. Bail reform, decarceration, um, uh, uh, re, uh, uh, commitments and investments into community. These are public health and safety solutions that actually work. Uh, and uh, they're extremely fiscally responsible. Uh, they should be championing these modest wins and pushing even further. So demand that they stand behind these laws and these changes and actually provide their constituents with truth. So. That, that, that's my takeaway. <laughs> Thank you, Walt. What do you want people to walk away with in about a minute? And then we'll turn to sure. MK to close us out. I think it's uh, I think it's very important that we, we, we live in an age where there is a lot of misinformation out there and we have to question our news sources. And I think that that's part of becoming a better democracy. One of the things that I've uh, that I there's a takeaway that just entered my mind as I'm listening to these great panelists talk was, you know, there was, I'd listen to CNN, Fox, MSNBC. I'm just trying to get some information on Brittany Griner and what her story is. And what they say is, you know, can you believe Russia has a 99% conviction rate in Russia? So she's going to, and I go, there's a 99% conviction rate here in the United yeah. States. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there's a lot of ways that the media can trick us. And I think that they've succeeded, but I think that we also have tools now to fight back. Twitter, asking, you know, calling our elected officials, some of the stuff that, you know, that the other panels talk about. So that's, that's my takeaway. MK, close us out. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> yes. Check your sources. Cops lie. Um, it's unbelievable how often that is true. I've seen it with my own eyes. We've all witnessed it happen and the frequency cannot be overstated. So when you're reading a news source, figure out what the source is. And if they don't say what it is, it's probably the cops. That's the way that media works. So check your sources. Um, be conscious of your language, um, your own language, using people at people first 
you know, incarcerated or accused person, right? A person who was accused of a crime, a person who was harmed by a crime, all of these things that don't flatten and instead allow us to see the three-dimensional value of our neighbors, whether they are somebody who's made a mistake or allegedly made a mistake or somebody who's been harmed by that mistake, they're still complicated, complex beings and are deserving of that honor. Um, and then when you're conscious of it, you're going to see it more often, right? You're going to notice headlines that don't use that language. You're going to notice articles that decide to flatten and simplify and presume about people that they're talking about. And then it becomes more clear to you once you're cognizant of that, both how you're using language, but also to be skeptical about the sources that you're reading. Um, you know, and cops also use this language ex post facto, right? I've represented victims of police brutality who after they are assaulted for absolutely no reason, and even if they cops had a reason it's not okay but who are assaulted and then after the fact police will do something like leak their alleged gang status so it doesn't just help them vilify people who are accused of crimes it helps them signal who is deserving of harm and who is undeserving of care and that language is critical to that message for them and for us to counter it and then the last thing i'm going to say is listen to young people um you know, Mariam Kaba says that hope is a discipline. I have to wake up every day and commit myself to hope because it can be really hard feeling the pressure and the tides that continually seem to move us in the wrong direction. Um, but working with people who have that hope, working with young people who are awesome and are too often spoken over, spoken for, not invited to the table. Um, I have two interns, really colleagues who are listening to this call right now. I'm learning from them more than they're learning from me. So when I go and do Know Your Rights trainings, I'm glad to impart my knowledge of the law to them, to let them know what their rights are, to empower them, to encourage them to vindicate their rights. But the truth is the law will not save us. The law is designed to support the institutions that we've been complaining about for this entire panel. It is people and young people specifically that are going to get us where we need to go. So making sure that everyone whose voice needs to be heard is part of the conversation is critical. And I'm just so happy to have been here with all of you. Walter Pavlo, Scott Hetchinger, Daiwan Tatro, M.K. Kashang, thank you all so much for being a part of this panel. Thank you to all of the attendees who came and joined us today. Thank you for your questions. We will continue to have more discussion around this issue with action. So everyone have a good day. Continue to be safe, stay aware, and stay informed. Be well. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.